Uh, I too would like to thank Matt and Heather and Rebecca and James and Angie, who I had many, many email correspondences with to kind of get, get me here, get me here on time, get me to the right place. I'm grateful to be asked. I'm grateful to get out of my office to actually be in a different place for a little bit. And uh, I, I wasn't going to do this, but since everybody seems to be so fixated on Bibles and bullets, you know, and where they end up. And it, so I've spent the last 30 years doing Bible publishing in various forms. So I read a lot of stories about Bibles. And Mark Twain has this great moment where he talks about a Civil War soldier walking under the window of a five-story hotel, okay? And all of a sudden, out of one of the hotel windows flies a Bible, and it goes right for this guy's heart, okay? And when the Civil War soldier tells this story later, he says, I'm just grateful I had my lucky bullet in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah, leave, leave it to Twain to take just a, a great trope. And, uh, you know, I do. I wish that I had popsicles to offer you guys at the end of the talk, <laughs> just to kind of... Okay, so uh, I'm going to start a little bit differently in that I'm going to give you something to look at here. Okay, this is a woman's devotional Bible. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think about something, and you can turn to the person next to you if you want to and kind of talk about this, but this is a this is pretty well-known Bible, but this Bible almost never saw the light of day, okay? So I want you to think for a minute, like, what would keep this Bible from being published? So I'm going to give you 30 seconds. You can talk amongst yourselves. All the clues are there, so... Okay, okay, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to bring you back in fear that this might have been the high point of the talk, that you might have you might have learned more from each other than what I'm gonna share. Um, any theories on it? and I know the resolution isn't great at the bottom it says with daily devotions from godly women. That's that's the little subtext there. So any any theories on why this uh, almost never saw the light of day? <laughs> It doesn't look like a Bible. Pink. Uh, uh, economics. They assume it wouldn't sell. If they felt like this wouldn't be a huge seller, they wouldn't have cared about selling it. Why? It's not. It's not King James, right? So. The first big word. Women's. This is. It's a pretty, pretty savvy group here. Okay. What you need to know is this is Zondervan Publishing. Okay, Zondervan makes, it cuts its teeth, actually, on the NIV, uh, gets involved in the NIV project a little bit later. They ran out of money. Zondervan picked them up. And in the 1980s, they got an idea to uh, start to do uh, what we would call niche Bibles, okay? Different kinds of Bibles, okay? And so what you have here is in the, about 1984, there was a moment where the editorial staff at, uh, at Zondervan says, we, we cannot do this women's Bible, okay? And their big argument here was basically twofold. It doesn't look like a Bible, and it's pink, okay? The color was a huge, huge issue, okay? There are four women at Zondervan that really kind of lead the charge in this, and uh, Stephanie Derrick has done some really interesting work on this and has interviewed these women, and it's, they are just unsung heroes in this niche Bible market because, frankly, they really push Zondervan to think about kind of this knit, doing a woman's Bible, and it is so amazingly successful that this is why we have all the other Zondervan niche Bibles, like the Fireman's Bible and the Policeman's Bible and, the, you know, the Recovery Bible. And, the Bible for uh, cooks. I mean, you know, they just, they went whole, whole hog in the differentiation, okay, after 1984. This is the 1990 version. They are just making money, okay? And the, and the women behind this never get mentioned in any, any of the Zondervan kind of uh, histories of the day. And it's, 
it, but it reminds you of just kind of the human element when we talk about this kind of stuff. And that's what I want to talk about today is, um, is the editors. And uh, so we'll, we'll go with this. Okay? From God's lips to the human heart, such runs the mythic ideal of how a divine message moves from creator to creation. As is so often true with divine drama, however, there are frequently a host of uncredited players who take up key roles. And today I want to spend just a few minutes reflecting upon the godlike powers of the editor of sacred texts when it comes to bringing sacred words to the masses. And because everybody had to have a metaphor, here's my metaphor, okay? When it comes to, to written sacred texts, it is helpful to consider how such words eventually meet their readers. And in such considerations, it is helpful to think of the delivery vehicles and the editors who drive those vehicles. How, in fact, do sacred words come before their readers for consideration. And I'm going to look at two editors of sacred texts today to tease out some of the larger implications of the importance of editorial hands and the divine drama of religious publication. Now, a few years ago, I gave a talk on, on Orson Pratt, and some of you were there, so let me just give you a warning. There's about five minutes of overlap. So if you were there three years ago, you can fall asleep for the next five minutes, but then we're going to really hit it. So uh, there we go. Orson Pratt. I want to just say at this moment, uh, hey, Joe. Yep. So I, I, I love this picture, OK? Anybody who works in the 19th century has to love the hair of the 19th century, OK? People in the 19th century cared about their hair, OK? Orson was no exception to that. And uh, I've always thought this would make just a great t-shirt, OK? It would just make a great t-shirt. And in fact, Matt, come on down. Okay. Because I, I did this with Joe, and, and what I've done, I, I always like to leave people with something. And there you go. That is, that is the famous, my famous Orson is the man t-shirt. Now there are two of those, because I gave one to Joe Spencer, and now you have one. And when, when I was in graduate school, um, some friends of mine and I had an email chain in which we passed back and forth outstanding, terrifying, wonderful Orson Pratt quotations. Okay. So this is appropriate. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that warms my heart. <laughs> okay, the first editor we will look at is the early Mormon apostle Orson Pratt. I believe that one could make the argument that aside from Mormonism's founding prophet, Joseph Smith Jr., no single person played a larger role in shaping the Book of Mormon's content and presentation, and thus influencing future interpretive paths of this sacred text than Orson Pratt. By all accounts, Orson Pratt was a strong-willed and irascible man. Born a year before the, year of 18, the War of 1812, Pratt was just 19 when he became one of Smith's first converts in 1830. Punctuated by only a short period of disgruntlement, Pratt remained a faithful Latter-day Saint for the next 51 years, establishing himself as one of, the early, of early Mormonism's great intellectuals and being appointed to such important roles as the leader of the church's British mission and serving as one of the original members of the Quorum of the Twelve. Today, I'm most interested in the last 10 years of Pratt's life. Considering the average life expectancy of a man in the 19th century, 19th century America hovered around 38 years of age, by the time Pratt entered his 70s, he was a man totally focused on his life's legacy. He knew that he was in the final years of his earthly pilgrimage, and he wished to make his life count for something. In his mind, his legacy was inextricably tied to the Book of Mormon, a text that had inspired his conversion at age 19, a text he had spent a lifetime interpreting and defending. Pratt was fond of claiming in his final years that he had read the book, quote, more carefully than any other man who had ever lived, unquote. Pratt wished to leave his mark upon the Book of Mormon by creating an edition of it that was par excellence. LDS book printing activities, which had long been established in Liverpool, England, were transferred to Salt Lake City in the 1870s. And Pratt used the centralization of the church's publishing enterprise to argue for the need for a new Book of Mormon edition. 
1879 edition would set the standard for the Book of Mormon, for Book of Mormon editions that would follow it in the next century in three ways. First, its attention to collation of former editions to weed out inaccuracies in typesetting and word choices. Now, we may think this is like everybody does this when they're doing sacred texts. Uh, not everybody does do this. Some, some people don't pay much attention to like former editions or, or typographical errors. Pratt was focused, okay? Second, Pratt went on to add footnote commentary that linked book, the book to certain geographic no notions of where the book's narrative took place. He used the footnotes to tie specific locations in the Book of Mormon to specific locations in the Americas. For example, the promised land found in 1 Nephi 2023 was glossed in a footnote as, as, quote, believed to be on the coast of Chile, South America, unquote. Although Pratt's footnotes dropped out in later editions, their influence can still be seen in important, important versions of the Book of Mormon. In the 1963 edition, for example, geographical ties to, the, to South and Central America persisted as the book's illustrations strongly suggested links between archaeological work in Central America and the ancient civilizations described in the Book of Mormon. While many of these illustrations were removed from the, from the later 1981 edition of the book, the one that we're probably most familiar with is still the 1981. That was the, that was the moment of just really high level scholarship being brought to, to, uh, brought to the collation and typesetting of the book. One sees that even in the artwork found in this book's most recent edition, such as John Scott's Jesus Christ Visits the Americas, where Jesus appears to the Nephites and was clearly a Mesoamerican setting, the geographical freighted editorial choices that Pratt first set out in his 1879 edition are still present today. And I'm not arguing that Pratt was the first to ever kind of make that connection. What I am arguing is Pratt got it into the book, and the book went everywhere, okay, and had incredible influence. Um, and then third and finally, the creation of special new apparatus such as improved chapter and verse markings. Um, okay, anybody that's ever kind of tried to do chapter and verse markings, that's a lot of work. And then if you get it kind of institutionalized, like in the Book of Mormon, you've made a contribution, okay? That, that changes how people read that book for the rest, you know, the rest of that kind of publishing cycle. These chapter and verse marks formatted the book in a more stereotypical and easily identifi identified biblical fashion. These chapter and verse markings were carried forward into the influential 1920 edition of the book, which also introduced the common biblical printing presentation of double columns. With all these editorial changes, the Book of Mormon was looking ever more like the Bible, the most established sacred book in the United States. Now, I want to turn to our second editor. Okay. While Pratt was leading the way to making the Book of Mormon look ever more biblical, I want to look at a moment in more recent American Bible publishing history that ran in the exact opposite direction of Pratt's editorial choices. While Pratt and those who followed him worked hard to make the Book of Mormon imitate the sacred immutable Bible, a host of American Bible publishers were running in the opposite direction. I want to look at the editor of one such publisher, a woman who convinced her publishing house to put the sacred text of the Bible in the highly mutable and ephemeral form of a magazine. The editor we turn now to is not a grizzled old warrior, but a vibrant young woman by the name of Kate Etu. Etu was an editor at Tom and Nelson Publishers, the largest for-profit publi Bible publisher in the United States. And when she approached her bosses with the idea of publishing a Bible edition for teenage girls in the form of a magazine, her bosses did not like the idea. The Bible was a sacred volume, and its presentation should reflect its importance. And when I interviewed Kate Ito, Ito um, it was really interesting to hear her reflect on that moment because she was basically asked to leave the room when she first introduced this idea, okay? There, it was beyond closed. It was like they weren't even willing to entertain it. And she had, the, uh, she just had a lot of moxie. I mean, she went, went back to it. Um, for the older editorial staffers at Thomas Nelson Bible, 
Bible editions were frequently bound in leather to mirror the importance and durability of the text, not in the same glossy paper that covered the transient contents of magazines like Elle, Vogue, and Cosmopolitan. It was only through great perseverance that Ichu was finally able to convince them to give her idea a chance. She firmly believed that a Bible for young girls that looked like a magazine would be popular and lead such women toward rather than away from the sacred text. So in July 2003, Thomas Nelson released the magazine Bible Revolve, a name that was meant to signal the constant motion and change inherent in the life of these teenagers. Once one opened its covers, the contents were also a clear echo of this generation's magazine culture. Revolve contained calendars, quizzes, beauty and dating tips, and countless lists that young readers can read alongside the New Century version, a modern language translation of the Bible owned by, yes, you guessed it. Uh, you guessed it. it. It was owned by Thomas Nelson. So Revolved contained the New Testament, but it contained so much more. The resounding success of this particular Bible format surprised everyone at Thomas Nelson Publishing, even Kate E. Too, who championed the idea. A typical Bible edition sells 40,000 copies in a given year. Upon its release, Revolve was selling 40,000 copies a month. Clearly, this Bible edition had been hugely successful in capitalizing on the teenage girl girls' magazine culture by crossing it with a New Testament and magazine guise. What is less clear is just what this guise might mean to interpreting the New Testament that it held. The interpretive consequences of such formatting choices are profound. Even the most casual reader will notice that on a page after page, the actual biblical text in Revolve is crowded out by the apparatus that surrounds it. The biblical text becomes just one text among many. Here, it may be helpful to think of what one might call a reader's interpretive energy when they try to make sense of a text on a page. If there's only a single column of words on a page, the vast majority of the reader's interpretive energy will be spent on the words on that page. If a picture appears with those words, the reader's interpretive energy is divided and eventually redirected by the presence of words in an illustration in such close proximity on a page. The reader's view of a picture will be informed by the accompanying words, as well as the interpretation of the words will be influenced by the presence of the picture. In several pictures, sidebars, or other formatting inclusions accompany a text, a reader's interpretive energy is again redirected to attempt to make sense of the various texts, both singularly and then in combination. All this works both to create new texts by combining the many different texts and the meanings on the page, and it also serves to diffuse the attention and importance placed on any single given element found on a page. So what you want to kind of think about at the end of the day is one of the things that uh, the, the editors at Thomas Nelson and Zondervan were very worried about was the diffusion of attention that the formatting would cause. And so one of the things that they continue to kind of deal with is these, these Bibles are the ones that are excelling incredibly well but there are consequences to the interpretations thereof. And there's immense, immense power in the editorial staff. You know, everything from the concordances they include to the indexing. So, there you have it. Yeah. Okay. Um.